Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2, Quick Surf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. You can uh, do so a variety of ways. Uh, on our website, we provide a subscription feed uh, for an Og Vorbis feed, uh, an MP3 feed of the show, as well as a video feed of the show that's compatible with a wide range of devices. Um, we also uh, upload the show to YouTube.com, Dailymotion, blip.tv and you can find us online over at stitcher.com and tunein.com so nice wide array uh, array of uh, places you can uh, find us online we're always looking for new places uh, to uh, upload uh, and distribute to um, you can shoot me an email geekinator at quicksurf.com and uh, you know feel free to provide any kind of feedback you want and with that, let's go ahead and get into some of the cool stuff that I, excuse me, that I found for this uh, episode. Um, over at Ars Technica, they uh, have a story here. Uh, Asus brings 4K to your desktop with a massive 31.5 inch uh, 3840 by 2160 monitor. Now, this thing is a monster. It's a monster by many standards. This this is this is a pretty sizable uh, <laughs> monitor. This is small TV size. Um, now, thirty eight forty by twenty one sixty. You know, that's not really four K by film four K standards. Film four K is is uh, at least four thousand ninety six pixels wide. What this is this thirty eight forty by twenty one sixty. Is basically full HD, the 1920 by 1080, stacked too wide and too high. So your 1920 times two is 3840, and 20 and 1080 times two is 2160. So basically, it's four times the number of pixels as a full HD 1080 uh, picture. And so this. In TV land, this is actually fairly common, and it's commonly referred to as ultra high def. Uh, still pretty cool, um, you know. Uh, it, I'd love to have one. It's probably obscenely expensive. Uh, so anyway, it's just announced. Um, you know, if you've got a twenty something uh, ten eighty display, my display is a twenty four inch. It's nineteen twenty by twelve hundred. I've been looking and considering getting something along the lines of a 27 incher uh, that's at least 2560 by 1440 or something to that or or 2560 by 1200. Um, this would be really great. It uh, uses Display Port and it has a dual HDMI input, integrated speakers, and an adjustable stand. Uh, there are some challenges. Not all video cards can drive such a humongous display. Uh, my laptop is relatively new and has display port, so I'm fairly certain that it'll be able to drive a fairly high display like that, seeing as Apple uh, sells a 2560 by 1440, I think, uh, display. Uh, this is a little bit larger than that, but uh, yeah should be pretty interesting um i don't didn't see a price uh but it should be available in north america toward the end of june and yeah there is no pricing available so there you go it'll probably be you know at least a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks one to two grand from read write web in their hack section uh there's a story here that i thought was interesting and i i thought i'd bring it up simply because it's, I think that it's relatively important. It's entitled, Why Programming is the Core Skill of the 21st Century. More often than not, you know, a lot of jobs, especially if they're technology-related jobs, if you want to make a good paycheck, you got to know how to code. You got to know how to code. At least in something that looks like C or C++ or Java or Ruby or PHP, uh, Microsoft Technologies, 
Um, you know, it, you've got to know how to, how to write, how to write code, how to architect programs, that sort of thing. So anyway, uh, it's the, the article starts off here in the 20th century. Meaningful education was all about learning your ABCs. Today, it's centered on alphas, betas, and C++. Programming skills are becoming ever more important, quickly turning into the core competency for all kinds of 21st century workers. This is, uh, you know, I've seen this time and time again. The inescapable fact is leading individuals, that inescapable fact is leading individuals to seek out new ways of learning to code, startups and nonprofits to find ways to help them, and businesses to search for innovative approaches to finding the coders they so desperately need. You know, um, there's been a real, and this is something I've noticed over the last five to 10 years, I've been writing code for longer than that, but there's been a real need for, as, uh, for computer programmers, as systems have gotten more complex, you know, uh, even in just general IT servers, uh, you know, administering servers and that sort of thing has gotten complex to the point where even, you know, a basic IT guy needs to have basic coding skills to get his job done. Because more often than not, especially if you're working at a relatively large company, uh, you know, you need to know how to write SQL queries. They've got, you know, a whole strew of, you know, databases. They've got a whole bunch of servers, a bunch of admin tasks. That if you were to do manually, it would take you weeks to do, you know, you need to know how to, you know, script up, script stuff together. Uh, for the more serious stuff, there's quite a few uh, places that have in-house software that they, you know, the, the vast majority of software at least a good chunk of the software, well, not the vast majority, but a good chunk of the software that I have coded over the last 15 years hasn't been for publicly released code. It's been for in-house stuff, or I was at a technology company and there was, you know, stuff that they sold, but it was part of a product. And the code that we developed was to enable the product. So we weren't selling software, but we were writing code to make products work. And there was a bunch of tooling that we had, you know, custom developed tooling that we had to do because more often than not, you know, you get into situations where you need a testing framework and nobody makes it, especially if you're being innovative in doing stuff that nobody else has done. Nobody makes the tools to do the stuff that you're trying to do. It's, you have to write the code to do it. You know, someone does. And more often than not, you know, it's something that gets developed in house and, uh, you know, that's been the case. I've had, you know, I've developed in-house uh, uh, software support packages to help, you know, kind of bring a dashboard together of information that call center workers would use. And this was all, you know, uh, you know, stuff that was done in-house because there was no, you know, it was cheaper for the company to have an on-staff developer that they paid, you know, a, a, enough money to keep him happy than and have him, you know, spend his days developing stuff for them to do, you know, stuff that they can use in house than it was to, you know, pay a software company to, to either find a software company that made software that did what they needed to do one and then pay and then two pay them for a licensing fee to do all this stuff more often than not, you know, a lot of these, especially when you get into large software suites, they provide a, f a programming framework so that you can do all of this in-house stuff. So anyway, um, you know, if you are a young person uh, and you want to get into technology, really, you know, if you don't want to have a Starbucks job or, you know, what I refer to, and this is not a, you know, I'm not dissing anybody's jobs here, but what I tend to refer to is kind of a disposable job where it's a low end, you get paid, you know, roughly minimum wage, it's high turnover, you know, Taco Bell, Burger King, Jack in the Box, that sort of thing, Starbucks, uh, you work at a grocery store, you know, that, uh, that kind of stuff. You know, if you want to get out of that kind of job class and get into something, uh, you need to have computer skills and you, and more often than not, you need to know how to code at least do basic scripting, 
in Microsoft Office using macros and that sort of thing. If you can't figure that out, you have a real problem. Um, from Engadget, Tesla details supercharger expansion. New York City to LA road trips are possible by year's end. This is actually pretty cool. I've been strongly considering a uh, buying a Model S. Um, the thing that I'm a little, that has been kind of holding me back it has been, I can't take it on road trips. I can't drive, uh, you know, like I, I have a house in Phoenix and family in Phoenix and I have family up in Oregon and, you know, there's uh, the West coast has a lot of family all up and down the coast that I, I would r routinely would regularly, uh, you know, take road trips and, and visit on a regular basis simply because it's less expensive to take a road trip than it is to fly myself and, you know, my family. And so, um, my major concern with buying a, a model S or any electric vehicle really is, you know, one, the range on a Model S is about equivalent to what you'd get out of a tank of gas on a regular car. You know, you're looking at 300-ish miles or so. If you got really good gas mileage, my current car gets, you know, three on the highway, three to 400 miles out of a tank. So, you know, if if Tesla could hit that 300-mile mark, if they had a supercharger at least every 300 miles for a lot of major interstates, uh, at least relatively well-traveled ones between major metropolitan areas, I think that they would do pretty well. They've unveiled a map uh, that shows what they're looking to do. There's actually a, a video that they have posted. Um, you know, that and that makes me a lot more comfortable about buying a car from Tesla. It really does. You know, I, I am much, much, much more comfortable buying a car from Tesla. If I know that between Petaluma, California and Phoenix, Arizona, if I go down I-5 or I-15, to uh, Interstate 10 and take Interstate 10 across to Phoenix, I will be able to stop and charge my car, uh, you know, at regular intervals. You know, if you're traveling with a family or more than a couple of people, it's generally not a bad idea to stop every, you know, every time you need to tank up, at least every time you need to tank up. And just take 15, 20 minutes, stretch, especially if you're an adult, you know, 300 miles <laughs> is like four hours of driving. Um, you know, it, it, the, by the time you've been in the car for four hours, you're, you're looking to get up and, you know, go to the bathroom and kind of walk around for a little bit, maybe get something to drink, get some food, that sort of thing. So, you know, if they can get the charging stations, you know, it'd be great if they could get charging stations installed at rest stops or have the charging station be a rest stop where you can go in, have some food, you know, that sort of thing. That would be awesome. Anyway, uh, I'm really encouraged with this. Uh, it makes me a lot more comfortable about, you know, buying a Model S. So we'll see uh, what comes of it. From Gizmodo, a full scale. Lego T800 Terminator sent in back in time to blow our minds. This guy has built a T800 Terminator from uh, the Terminator movie franchise that we all are probably familiar with. Uh, and uh, he, he has built a, a full scale T800 out of Lego. It looks awesome. It actually looks pretty realistic, believe it or not. Um, and it uh, is pretty slick. Definitely check it out. I can't believe he made this out of Lego. I've definitely got to look at this a little closer and find out what he did. But uh, it, with the exception of the fact that it's not shiny, um, it looks a lot like <laughs> it looks a lot like a T800. Uh, pretty sweet. From Slash Gear. Windows 8 fully detailed with the return of the start button. We've been hearing a lot about Windows 8.1. Actually, let me rephrase that. Windows 8.1 fully detailed with the return of the start button. We've been hearing a lot about Windows 8.1 lately. And while it's been confirmed for a little while, very few details have made their way into the ether. However, Microsoft unwrapped 
plenty of details about the upcoming update. And there are a handful of updated apps and new features, as well as the return of the start button as previously uh, rumored. So this gives you a nice walkthrough of what to expect for Windows 8.1. A lot of people are, have been really unhappy with Windows 8 because it got rid of a lot of stuff um, and, and uh, was less than easy to use on a non-touch enabled PC, if you will. So, uh, pretty interesting. I'm curious to see, um, you know, I, I've not, I've still got a computer that's windows seven. I haven't booted it up in a while. Um, I'm curious to see what, what windows 8.1, uh, would look like over windows seven. I know what windows eight looks like over windows seven and I'd never upgrade to windows eight. So I'm, curi I'm just curious to see what, uh, what Microsoft is, 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 uh, what they're actually going to do. I mean, there's a lot of rumors and they do have some details here, but I'm, I'm, I'm cause this, this is not a touch PC. So I'm really curious how it will look and behave for on a PC. That's, that's, you know, like a classic, I've got a keyboard, mouse and monitor from PC world. When malware strikes, how to clean an infected PC. This is a nice little walkthrough. If you get infected, this is a great checklist of things that you should do to, to clean the PC. If you want to do it yourself, I guarantee you, uh, if you take this to somebody to clean their, clean your PC more often than not, like, for example, I used to do a lot of this. I, uh, back home in Phoenix, I had a company where I would, you know, people would have a problem with the computer and they could bring it over and I'd, I'd fix it for a fee. Um, you know, reading through this, this is stuff that I would do 90% of the, the computer problems that I got from people, uh, it, it, their computer was just infected. And I, I would literally, you know, follow these steps to do it, even though this, uh, you know, it, this is just something that I did out of, you know, lots of experience and lots of removing stuff. This is a pretty good documentation on how to clean off an infection. So definitely give it a look. We've all had an infected computer at one point or another. From Hackaday, programming a through-hole ARM microcontroller. I thought this was pretty neat. The age of ARM microcontrollers for the electronics hobbyist is upon us, and luckily there are a few breadboard-friendly microcontrollers available in a DIP package. One of these chips is NXP's LPC810M021FN8. It's an 8-pin DIP with 4K flash, 1K of SRAM, and has a clock fast enough for some really cool stuff. Uh, however, you need a way to program this, and um, so uh, this person came up with an easy method using only a USB slash UART adapter. So, pretty neat. Um, definitely check this out. From CNETnews.com, um, we've all heard of Adobe's, and I've I've talked about this uh, fairly at length in the past we've all heard of adobe's creative cloud subscription just you know as a disclaimer here i am a creative cloud user i have been for since shortly after adobe uh, started creative offering creative cloud and i've had no complaints however this uh, is a survey creative suite users loathe adobe's subscriptions i've heard quite a bit about this and i think Part of the uproar is people who don't actually purchase Creative Suite. You know, there's still a fair number of people out there that don't buy the suite. They buy the individual programs. They're unhappy about this. They're the most unhappy about this. People who buy Creative Suite, even if they only upgrade every three or four years, like I generally don't upgrade that frequently. I only upgrade when I absolutely have to. Uh, if you look at how much Adobe charges for Creative Suite, uh, even for the upgrades, you know, like if you go from CS2 to CS4 to CS6, which that's, you know, you're skipping versions between. Um, if you don't upgrade every time they release a new Creative Suite, you even you skip versions or something of that nature. Uh, they, you know, you're still looking at spending, you know, by the time you figure out how much they charge um have a sneeze coming on 
um, you're still spending all in from the time you buy the first creative suite, which you have to buy a full copy at some point to get into creative suite to begin with. By the time you lay out that, you know, $2,500 for creative suite master collection, which by the way, that's the least expensive, uh, version or of creative suite. If you use more than two or three apps out of all of that, um, you know, that's, you know, like for example, I use, Acrobat Professional all the time, Dreamweaver all the time, Photoshop all the time, uh, Premiere Pro all the time, um, Adobe Audition all the time. That's five applications. If I were to buy those separately, it'd be more than $2,500. If I buy Creative Suite Master Collection, it's $2,500. It's close to a thousand dollars to upgrade from cs2 to cs4 and close to a thousand dollars to upgrade from cs4 to cs6 uh so by the time you divvy up over that five six year period from your initial cs2 purchase to the point you get to cs6 that's twenty five hundred dollars thirty five forty five ish hundred dollars uh, over that many months, it still comes out to like 70 bucks a month is what you're, you're, you know, on average is what you're laying out for $49 a month. You get the latest version of creative cloud. So, you know, I personally myself, because I am a, I was a creative suite user before, and I did the math and said, well, you know, so far I have you know, $2,500 for for the initial version that you have to buy, plus, you know, the uh, roughly $1,000 for the upgrade because I skipped versions. Adobe knows how to price their stuff. They know $49 is less expensive, you know, if you upgrade every other version, um, which comes out to every two to three years. So anyway, uh, I suspect a lot of the uproar is less to do with users who use creative suite and more to do with users who piecemeal the software they buy photoshop right or they buy premiere pro or they buy a sub suite they buy uh you know creative not creative suite master collection they buy creative suite production or creative suite design you know, or something of that nature. And so they don't get the full collection of software. And that is less expensive if you don't do master collection. But in my particular case, uh, it was just, you know, given the eclectic collection of Adobe software I used, it was less expensive to just do creative suite master collection. And so I was actually looking to go to CS6 and I looked at the upgrade cost and was like, oh man, to go from CS4 to CS6, this is going to kill me. But if I go to Creative Cloud for 50 bucks a month, I get CS6 and I will continue, you know, to get the latest version. So I made the jump to and and I've never looked back. They've done a really good job of updating, uh, you know, Creative Cloud on a pretty regular basis. So anyway, uh, check out the article, you know, I I think that most of the uproar is from people who don't actually use the full creative suite master collection. And so they're looking at it going, Oh, this is more expensive for us. You know, whereas, you know, there's a fair amount of people like me who have no problem with it. And quite frankly, I would still be using CS five and being held back on an old version of an operating system and wouldn't be able to upgrade my computer and all this other stuff because the newest version of OS 10 broke <laughs> Creative Suite 5 or 4 or whatever version I was on. So, you know, there's there are, there are reasons to, to, to be up to date when you're dealing with a large software suite. From TechCrunch, uh, turn Raspberry Pi microcomputer into a low-cost laptop with this atrix dock hack this is pretty cool uh, definitely check it out uh, yeah i'm not going to get into too much detail because we're already running a little bit long we're uh, right around uh, almost just about 25 minutes or so but uh, they've, there's a youtube video on how to do this um, you know i'm a huge fan of raspberry pi so definitely give this a whirl and uh, check it out 
That will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything I've talked about is linked up in the show notes. You can find those online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. You can shoot me an email, geekinator at quicksurf.com. You can uh, also find us online at a variety of places. If you've already subscribed to the show, thank you so much for supporting the show. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.